Great question. Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything that we do. Welcome in today. Thank you so much for joining. Welcome in to Care Patrol uh, presentation of Care Concierge, which is uh, both the name of our associates and the name of this series. And today we are going to be doing a presentation on Medicare Advantage or disadvantage. We'll discuss that today. Uh, your mics are unmuted, uh, so you're welcome to join the discussion at any time uh, via your microphone, uh, or you're always welcome to use the chat room. Please do be attendant to knowing whether your mic is on and you may not be aware, um, as that's the reason that we initially didn't mic folks in this presentation. Uh, some time ago when my colleague and friend Jay Jones did this for us. So welcome in today to Care Concierge with Care Patrol. We're going to discuss Medicare Advantage or Disadvantage. Uh, we're still letting folks in. And as we are, we'll move on to our housekeeping portion of the presentation, uh, just to let everyone know how we do things here. So uh, if you're new to us, thank you for joining us. If you were here uh, last Monday and saw my complete abject technical failure in getting this to work, then I appreciate uh, you for coming back. Uh, and if you're new to us, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, as I said earlier to folks, you can uh, unmic yourselves to join in the discussion or you can use the chat room. If you don't know how to use either in Zoom, just take your your cursor era and either move it up to the top of your screen and a little bar will come down with options like uh, a little picture of a microphone to unmute yourself, for example, or uh, a little box that says chat. You can open the chat room. And if it's not at the top of your screen, it's likely at the bottom. So move your cursor down. And that's how you can uh, join us uh, either way using chat or using uh, your microphone and your voice. And we'd love to hear what you have to say regardless of how you go about it. Uh, we use a evaluation tool to make sure that people are getting their information from us uh, called SurveyMonkey. And I'm gonna give the address to you all uh, now, uh, slowly, so that you can make note of it. Those of you who are using your phone or otherwise not able to see the screen, the evaluation link today for SurveyMonkey is https colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters b is in boy r c is in cat f c is in cat nine y so our survey link that we're using today via survey monkey is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters b as in boy r c as in cat f c as in cat nine why that's our survey monkey link as you know nurses and social workers we're credentialed by the alabama board of social work examiners as well as by the alabama board of nursing uh, and we're able to offer you live ceus which count as in person or face-to-face -face ceus because we use the survey monkey process that we use and that process includes a password the survey is password protected. So listen in at about 1245 today, 1250, somewhere in that time frame. I'll give the password out and you can then open the survey tool after the presentation. We load the nursing hours up onto the ABN website 
Uh, I don't believe nurses have that ca capability anymore. Uh, and social workers, we give you and nurses and everyone a certificate for uh, attending. So uh, anyone who needs contact hours in any field uh, may be able to use these credentialed by the Nursing Board of Alabama and by the Social Work Board of Alabama. And that's true if you're in another state even. So we still have a few people joining. Uh, I have given the link in the, uh, in the chat room and Ashley Talbert, you're so kind to do so again. You're always good about doing that and I appreciate seeing you back. And many of you, I do recognize your names and thank you for sticking with me. I know the technical difficulties that I had last week would lead anyone to believe that I am uh, kind of a Mickey Mouse kind of person uh, and I apologize because uh, I really do try and do a good job here. And I think we do actually except for my little lapses. So today we're gonna to discuss Medicare Advantage or disadvantage. And I've been looking forward to this, but we're gonna discuss first just a short history of Medicare. Uh, and then we're gonna detail some advantages of Medicare Part C, which as you probably already know, is also Medicare Advantage plans. And then we're gonna list some disadvantages of those Medicare Advantage plans. And you can, of course, as always, make up your own mind. And hopefully this will be enriching to you professionally uh, and personally, as we will all face, God willing, uh, aging into Medicare someday. So Medicare Advantage or disadvantage, let me get you started talking. Are you comfortable in your knowledge of Medicare history and the coverages around Medicare? I expect most of you are, but some of you don't work in payment, so you wouldn't be. So are you comfortable in your knowledge of Medicare? No response. Maybe they'll come in slowly. So I'll tell you, Medicare as an idea originated uh, under the President Theodore Roosevelt. It was his administration and his campaign in 1912 that first proposed a national healthcare system. And this was on the admittance of uh, the, uh, thank you all for responding uh, so much. This was uh, really, I think, at the uh, urging of some of the industrialists at the time, one of which is a name you may know, Kaiser, who started uh, what he wished to be an HMO. These were then outlawed in the 30s in the US, but that's a wholly different CEU that we did some time ago. Uh, but, but the real hold on the idea of having a national health care system was taken hold under President Truman, uh, who called for a plan during his term, but Congress did not uh, approve it. And then his uh, Democratic, I guess, or not predecessor, but uh, successor sometime later, uh, President Kennedy, uh, also created a task force uh, to create a national health care plan, but he limited it to people over 65. Uh, it wasn't approved by Congress, but the thinking here was uh, by Kennedy and others, like his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, who would sign into law Medicare in 1965, uh, they realized that people at that time in the 60s were beginning to live longer and they were retiring at 65 without health insurance, and this was a problem, as you know. Uh, so when the first cards from Medicare were given out, they were given to President Truman, who was still living at the time, and his wife, Bess. That was my dog, y'all. Her name is Frances. When Medicare was first introduced, and you may know it as original Medicare, it only had two parts, Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B, and this is why we call them uh, original Medicare, uh, because they were the only parts in the original Medicare law. Now, in 72, President Nixon expanded Medicare to include people with disabilities. And you may remember that the American Disabilities Act uh, came to fruition under Nixon. Uh, and it also extended coverage to people with end-stage renal disease, and that coverage is still in effect today. Uh, and it also allowed for Medicare supplemental plans to be offered by private insurance. Uh, these were called Medigap or Medicare supplement insurance. Uh, and in 1980, then the government began to regulate those plans. 
uh, uh, that were being sold uh, as Medigap or Medicare supplement plans. Uh, and so supplemental insurance uh, or Medigap uh, provides coverage for things that Medicare doesn't, like co-payments and deductible payments and something like health care when you travel. So if you travel abroad, overseas, then a private insurer plan, a Medigap plan, could make sure that you're covered for that. Now, the most comprehensive plan available is Plan F, and it covers all co-pays and deductibles. And any of you who work in the rehab arena also know that Plan F covers up to 100 days with no copay in skilled rehab. Now, if you have supplemental insurance and Medigap plan, you will still need a Part D plan. This is for prescription drugs. And if you don't buy it, when you first become eligible for Medicare, then you pay a penalty in the cost of that uh, insurance once you obtain it for the rest of the time that you have it. But unfortunately, uh, as of January 1, 2020, uh, Plan F and Plan C uh, that uh, cover deductibles can no longer be sold to new Medicare beneficiaries. So it's now no longer possible to get Plan F or Plan C. Uh, and I expect there is uh, logic behind this that we'll discuss in a moment. Everyone's comfortable. Thank you for letting me know. So in general, here's the difference in a Medicare Advantage plan, which we'll discuss a little bit deeper in a moment, and a Medicare Supplement or Medigap plan. So Medicare Advantage bundles so-called original Medicare, A and B, whereas a supplement plan only fills in the gaps of A and B, and it's only available if you have original Medicare, not if you have a Medicare Advantage plan. Medicare Advantage plans typically include a drug coverage portion. Medicare supplement plans do not. Um, Medicare Advantage plans have usually low monthly premiums, but high deductibles, high co-pays, and the cost of coinsurance. Supplemental plans may have a higher premium, but lower cost for medical care, uh, or even reduce co-pays and coinsurance and deductibles. Provider networks most Medicare Advantage plans have a, a limited number of providers that they have approved for you to see. Whereas if you have Medicare with a Medicare supplement, you can see any provider in the US who accepts Medicare. Medicare Advantage plans do not cover foreign travel, whereas Medicare supplement or Medigap plans, many of them do. And so, if we look at Medicare continuing after the advent of uh, Medicare supplement or Medigap plans, we see that hospice care was added in 1982. We've discussed this in another CEU uh, about the advent of hospice with Connecticut hospice. And at that time, as we discussed, uh, there was a book out, uh, I think it was called On Death and Dying. I'm not sure of the title, but the author was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And it was uh, something of a hit nationally, a bestseller, and she spoke before Congress. And this in part, we think, led to um, Medicare beginning to cover the cost of hospice. Uh, after 1988, people with a higher income paid more for their Medicare. Uh, and there have been the creation of programs to help lower income enrollees pay for Medicare premiums uh, throughout the 1990s. So there are currently 10 different Medigap plans available. A, B, C, D, F, G, K, L, M, and N. Again, you can only obtain C and F if you obtained Medicare, original Medicare, prior to 2000 or 2020 rather, uh, and then did not leave uh, original Medicare. So 1997, Part C was introduced. We know this uh, happened under President George W. Bush under the Balanced Budget Act and coverage started in 1999. These are Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare Part C plans. And I expect that 
part of the reason that C plans are no longer available as a Medigap is because of the advent of Part C Medicare Advantage plans, which are provided by also private insurance that contract with Medicare. So did, generally speaking, Medicare Advantage plans have a network of providers, and it's more of a model that you would see like you, you all do see with your employer coverage, where you're, there are certain you know, specialists or certain people you can see, you need you know, different privileges to do that. Uh, these plans, on the surface at least, must offer at least the same as original Medicare, and they all offer additional coverage uh, some cover dental, vision, prescription cost, they, it's a host of things that they cover. But just like today, Part A and Part B, which were original, Part A is hospital, Part B is medical. Most people today don't pay a premium for Part A, but do pay for Part B. Now, in uh, 1966, the Part B premium was $3 a month. And in 2021, the Part B premium was $148.50, which is a pretty significant rise, but still a, you know, a, a nominal amount to pay for insurance. So Medicare, as we know, has seen a whole bunch of changes. You all witness them every day, I'm sure, from expanded coverage uh, to allowing different people, more people to enroll in Medicare and adding protections to Medicare. Um, where's my arrow? And so I'm gonna ask y'all, because many of you are comfortable, as you, as you say, with your knowledge of Medicare, what do you think could be the next area targeted for expansion of Medicare? What do you think could be the next area targeted for expansion of Medicare? And I'll tell you mine as you think about it. I, my business is, is placing people in appropriate and safe care within private pay institutions like assisted livings and independent livings and specialty care assisted living uh, or placing sitters in the home with them. Medicare Advantage plans are beginning to pay for some of these services. I expect that in time, Medicare will become knowledgeable of this or will start collecting data. And y'all know that when Medicare starts collecting data, what happens? A policy change happens. You have a new way of doing things. The DRGs are an example. You know, they were collecting uh, information on different outcomes for different uh, surgeries and diseases. And what was born of that? DRGs in the hospital and HHRGs and others. But um, so I think that Medicare will start paying attention to this. And because Medicare Advantage plans receive Medicare money, uh, that assisted livings will... Um, then be off limits to persons like me to work with. Because as you know, uh, we could not work with a skilled nursing facility as they would not be able to pay us because of Stark Law. And if the same thing happens in assisted living, then I think that we will be out of business. So it's an interesting sort of perspective and place to be. So yeah, they, everyone was, I'm sorry, I'm reading the comments, which I always like to do. Thank you all for, for being participatory. Uh, we talked about plan F not being available. Gail, you say think, you think maybe long-term care in the home will be Medicare's next expansion. You're absolutely right on that. I think that'll be the very next thing. Home care and facility care expansion, Emily, that's what I think. Hopefully home health services. And by that, Priscilla, I bet you mean not home health, medical home health, but in-home care services. And they are in some instances, but I'll tell you an interesting story. I get probably a call per month, at least, from a sweet dear person who wants me to clean their house. And while I don't mind cleaning house, I clean my house with my wife um, and uh, I don't mind it at all, but that's not what I do. 
And I always ask, well, how, you know, I, I can't help you there. I, I can help you find maybe a sitter, but they're 25 an hour. It's going to be a four hour minimum. It's be a hundred bucks for someone to clean your house. That's kind of a lot. Maybe you could find a maid for cheaper. Um, but how did you get my name? And it's usually, um, and I won't name them, but it's usually a fairly well-known Medicare Advantage plan has given my name out as someone who can clean houses. And what this tells me is that they do not have the resources to provide their beneficiaries that they say they do because they have errantly listed me as someone who can clean houses and I do not. Um, Y'all are also saying sitter and home services. And Emily says, she knows Medicare guidelines will be more relaxed in the next year. And in regards to DME, that's good news. Thank y'all, as always, for participating. And I'm sorry to hold the floor there. I should have read more of your comments. So Medicare in 2003, there was the Mo Medicare Modernization Act. Uh, and this is when Part D was established. We discussed that. And then in 2010, uh, uh, President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act, uh, which is still in effect, and it added Medicare coverages for preventive care. And this was a big thing uh, and made these services free for Medicare enrollees. But is it not at no expense to Medicare? Uh, if you're a physician, at least of maybe when this became active two or three, maybe several years ago now, you could get about $130 reimbursement for a well visit once a year. Uh, and so, you know, it made sense for physicians to do those. And it was the way that Medicare incented them to do it. It was a pretty good number uh, for a questionnaire. Uh, and so Medicare not only added this, but they added a way to pay for it, I guess is my point. And they reduced the out-of-pocket expenses of the existing Part D plans. So... Making preventive care free is what made Medicare save money, as you would imagine. If you can catch a disease sooner in the process, you're less likely to be hospitalized and, and you know, have further injury. Now, because of this, I think the cost of Medicare Advantage plans are going down in response to the, the lessened cost of you know, critical care of someone that, that preventive care could have caught. So now in 2022, Medicare is bigger than ever, more expansive, offers more coverages, more ability to get coverages. Nearly 64 million Americans are covered by Medicare. And that'll be 64 million and 10,000 after today. And 64 million and 20,000 after tomorrow and so forth and so on. It's growing. Uh, and it's right now in 2020 was 4% of the gross domestic product, meaning that of all the money that we made as a country, 4% of that went to Medicare. I believe uh, Dr. Blank is on the line. He can correct me if he wishes. Uh, and in 2020, total Medicare spending was 917 billion dollars, billion, which is 917,000 million, which is hard to conceive of that kind of money or that, that size of anything, really, to me. Um, enrollees can choose which parts of Medicare they wish to enroll, and they can create coverage on a budget. So there's more opportunity for more people to get coverage in different ways. And so these are the good things about Medicare. Uh, Medicare Part A premiums, most people, as we said, don't pay. Part B or Part A deductible is $15.56 per period. Part B monthly premium is now up to a year or two years later, $170.10 per month. But the Part B deductible is only $233. Part D insulin covers insulin at $35 or less. There is additional coverage as related to COVID health, uh, telehealth. And that has expanded mental health coverage. Uh, and it also covers a new Alzheimer's drug. And it's called Aduhelm, I believe. And I don't know what the efficacy is it, of it is, 
I just know that when Medicare agreed to cover it, uh, it was $46,000. And they said, well, you've got to cut the price. And they did to $28,000, $28,200 per dose. Um, and so, you know, that's hopefully working for someone. Uh, and now people who have end-stage renal disease have even more coverage and ability options under Medicare Advantage. So that's been added with time. Now, as y'all know, enrollment is time sensitive. And if you are nearing the age of 65, you want to begin the application process about three months out so that you can be ensured that you will have coverage on the day you turn 65. You can also apply the month you turn 65 and three months following your 65th birthday, your coverage will be delayed or you must wait until open enrollment, which is every year from October 15th to December 7th, which I can remember because my oldest child was born on December 7th, uh, which was also the day of D-Day, uh, uh, a day that will live in infamy. Uh, you sign up for Medicare, original Medicare, on the Social Security medication, excuse me, administration website, but you can only apply for Medicare Advantage plans after you have original Medicare, and you do that through Medicare's plan finder tool on their website. Uh, and I have a, another presentation coming up Friday. We're doing lowering your, your cost of prescriptions and it's interesting when you go to the medicare.gov site around saving costs with prescriptions, most of that site is now given over to private insurance links, you know, and, and almost an advertorium uh, for, uh, for these uh, Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, it, it's an interesting thing that's happening uh, that we may not be paying attention to is the growth of these plans and what they really mean for us and for those we love. So C is additional insurance. It's offered by private insurance and it covers A and B, original Medicare, plus things like prescription drugs or dental coverage. This is my mother's most interested in dental coverage because she you know, pays uh, up front. Uh, but she's a teacher, so she's a member of the retirement systems of Alabama, and she cannot change her plan, and I cannot get her to understand this, uh, but if you are part of some other plan, and, and their plan is a Medicare Advantage plan, by the way, you can't change that plan or you lose Medicare altogether, uh, which is what I keep telling her. So um, that is an attractive way that they, they get folks is medical, dental, um, and maybe even hearing aids. You know, that would be something to offer. They've got to include exactly what A and B cover, which is inpatient hospital stay and treatment, limited stays in skilled nursing, inpatient rehab, limited home health care, hospice, doctor visits, laboratory tests, blood tests, x-rays, all laboratory type stuff, BME, mental health, which is somewhat new, emergency ambulance transportation, which is quite expensive if you've ever had to pay out of pocket as I have uh, with my mother, and preventive care, which is really the greatest thing since sliced bread, in my opinion. Uh, now, in addition to these, a lot of your Part C Advantage plans will offer dental, vision, hearing, prescription drug. They almost always offer some relationship with silver sneakers, and I'm sure if you don't know what that is, it's essentially an exercise program for people who are, you know, I guess 62 or 65 and older, uh, which is, you know, proper exercise for someone of that age, I, I'm assuming. Uh, transportation, home meal delivery, uh, in-home support, such as, you know, vacuuming, as they wanted me to do, support for caregivers. Uh, pain management, safety devices, so more DME. I, I remember one of you said, uh, Emily, that's relaxing uh, for us. And adult daycare, that's new to me. I didn't realize they would pay for that. Uh, I knew they had over-the-counter benefits. Uh, and so you can see that Medicare Advantage really seems great. Uh, some of the major folks who offer Part C or Advantage plans are Aetna, Blue Cross Blue Shields, so Blue Advantage is what we have in Alabama. 
Cigna Health Partners, Kaiser Permanente, and Kaiser was one of the leaders in bringing a national health care system and an HMO type approach to uh, the United States uh, at the turn of this last century. Uh, Select Health, United Healthcare, UPMC, I can't remember. I believe that our uh, RSA, Retirement Systems of Alabama, has just moved coverage from Humana Advantage to United Healthcare Advantage, which is a win for anyone using that insurance. Uh, but I wish they would go back to Blue Advantage. Uh, so what Medicare Advantage plan do y'all encounter the most often? Any of you that uh, do anything with billing or discharge planning, anybody encounter any specific plan over another, or do you see a new plan, a Medicare Advantage plan coming in front of you uh, as you uh, encounter patients in your clinic or hospital system or skilled nursing or wherever it may be? What Medicare Advantage plan do you most often come across in your practice, Viva Medicare, Humana, Blue Advantage, Violet, you work for Cigna. I hope I don't offend you, Violet. Thank you for listening. Uh, so, Violet, you recommend Cigna. Deborah, Humana, Jennifer, you work for Aetna. How interesting. Jennifer, Humana, and Cigna. So, I guess Violet and Jennifer, you can see who you're your competitors are reaching on the chat room. And I appreciate y'all listening in, especially this topic. So, oh, that you, well, you'll see, Violet, you will see, I think. Um, I hope I hope it's not too, too jarring, but thank you for being here. I really do mean that. So most of our Medicare Advantage plans are coordinated care plans which is commonly known as managed care and most commonly known as an HMO or an EPO or a PPO. You all know this. Emily Scott, question, how is an Advantage plan different from an HMO or is it? Uh, the Advantage plan is different in the payer source in one sense because they're paid by Medicare but in another sense, they operate like an HMO with a closed system of who they refer or who they approve you to see. So that's the similarity. And that's the privatization of Medicare really is, is what that's, I think, uh, is happening. So all of these, you know, have a common thread and that they restrict members to a certain network of providers. They all have cost sharing, uh, co-payment, and generally speaking, uh, you know, depend your Different plans have different co-payments based on the coverage that you elect or need. Uh, but usually, if you travel abroad, these are not going to be any help to you. And you can't get a Medigap plan if you have a Medicare Advantage plan. So you have to have a different approach. Uh, the HMO plans, and these, again, were in, really invented by Kaiser and other industrialists, Receive care from in-network healthcare professionals, but you need to see a specialist. Uh, you, you have to get a referral. So there's no premiums, no deductibles, and low co-payments with an HMO plan. You have to be, like all of them, already enrolled in original Medicare. I mean, I hope I answered your question. Uh, and then the PPOs, which are more popular, you go to wherever you want whether or not they're in the network, but the rates are different to out-of-network providers, which means that you may not be able to go and use your insurance at a provider you've used if they don't take the plan unless you pay cash. And you don't need a referral to see a specialist with a PPO, however. So, if you want Part B coverage outside of a Medicare Advantage plan, or if you have a Medigap plan, uh, you can get a standalone Part D plan. Um, and you can get a Medigap plan to help pay for that. Uh, and ultimately, shopping around for these may save you money in the long run. Notice I said in the long run. 
So things to consider when you're reviewing plans is, you know, what coverages are offered in a Medicare Advantage plan that is not offered in an original Medicare plan? And then what is your preference and type of the plan that you choose? Do you want a PPO or an HMO? Uh, and, you know, those are things you would want to make note of. And then you want to also try in, if you can, uh, dictate or, or budget out-of-pocket cost. So the average monthly premium is $33.57 for Medicare Advantage plans uh, across the U.S. And then you also, and this is most of consider your own medical situation. Um, that is primary when selecting your Medicare plan if you select something other than original. So as we said, Medicare covers 64 million people. And they're not all 65 plus, but many are. They signed up another uh, Medicare Advantage plans, signed up 2.3 million beneficiaries in 2022. Uh, and they, Medicare Advantage plans, now make up 45% of all Medicare enrollment. This began in 2009, I believe. 11 states now have half or more of their eligible populations enrolled in Medicare Advantage. And guess what? Medicare Advantage has continued to become a lucrative place for insurers to focus their time and energy. Chartist, which is a financial site, uh, expects that Medicare Advantage enrollment will outpace original Medicare or traditional Medicare in three years. In three years. So how does it work with, with Medicare Advantage? Emily, this may help you. Private insurers receive a fixed amount for a Medicare Advantage plan. So Medicare pays the same amount of money for your care as a beneficiary to the Advantage plan as they would pay to the providers providing those services for you. And the companies then can charge you out of pocket, even though in theory they've been paid for that, and then they establish rules around the usage of that around provider networks. They do have a limit on out-of-pocket cost yearly, which is called the maximum out-of-pocket or MOOP, which I'll say again, MOOP, because I like saying it. Each plan can have a different limit and the limit can change each year. And as you would expect, there's typically a, a relationship between the plan deductible and premium and the size of its MOOC. Not unexpected. Let's see. So I want to ask y'all, what changes in coverage have you seen for any patients who or clients who come in to see you? Have you seen any of them have coverage changes when they moved from one Medicare Advantage plan to another, or from Medicare to Medicare Advantage plan. So anyone said, oh, this is not covered now. Now you have to go through step therapy to get the same medication that you've been taking for years because you have a new plan. No response. I know it will come in shortly, so I'll move on. Nicole Clark, UHC doesn't give as many home health visits. Good to know. Infirmary Mobile no longer accepts Cigna. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't know, actually, but I appreciate you making the comment. Thank you all for saying something. I always love it when you participate because, A, I know I'm not boring you, uh, and B, uh, it makes it more engaging for everyone else. So thank you all. So what might be then the Medicare 
this advantage. So you have the right under federal law to purchase any Medigap plan if you switch to original Medicare within 12 months of the date you join a Medicare Advantage plan for the first time. First time. So if it happens again, you, you don't have that option. You may also switch from Medicare Advantage to original Medicare during open enrollment, or if you qualify for special enrollment. But you may not be able to purchase a Medigap policy if you switch after the 12 months. And if you are able, it will cost you a good bit more than it would have cost you when you first enrolled in Medicare. So Medicare Advantage, Part C, Medicare, and Original Medicare, Parts A and B. Let's compare them. In coverage, Medicare Advantage plans are private health plans with bundled coverage, Part A, Part B, and usually Part D. Original Medicare is Part A and Part B, hospital and medical. Drug coverage is usually included in Medicare Advantage. With Original Medicare, you must buy drug coverage through a Medicare Part D plan. Added benefits, there are really none with Original Medicare, at least none in terms of things like vision, hearing, dental, gym memberships, and other perks. There are other, uh, other uh, benefits. And Gail, I'll get to your question in a minute. Uh, Out-of-pocket costs, usually lower premiums with higher co-pays, uh, usually higher deductibles with lower co-pays with Medicare. And most initial costs are paid through monthly premiums, making it easier to budget. Uh, in terms of Medicare Advantage, provider networks are encouraged, uh, usually encourage provider networks, and not always, depends on which type of plan. Generally, specialists are by referral only. Uh, beneficiaries of Medicare can see anyone at any time without a referral. Uh, costs are mostly paid through deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance for Medicare Advantage plans. And with Medicare, uh, the initial costs are mostly paid through monthly premiums. So, Gail, let me get to your question. Question, are there any rules about not selling Advantage plans to people who would only be able to use a hospital in another county that they really don't have access to? When I worked in home health hospice a few years ago, some of my patients in Walker County were in an Advantage plan that only let them go to Princeton Hospital but the local ambulance would not take them that far. They had to pay out of pocket if they went to Walker Baptist. Seemed like that particular plan was not appropriate for that area. We'll get to your question about any rules. I, I think rules are coming, Gail. Um, I've already asked this question once. I, I won't ask it twice. I wanted to ask it a different way just to see if y'all had seen Medicare Advantage recipients denied coverage with your clinic or hospital after changing plans. But Gail, your example is perfect, uh, really in thinking of that um, as a, so when you do, if you do, and many of us probably will buy a Medicare Advantage plan, get a comprehensive list of all the co-pays and deductibles before you choose the plan for you. And also, go ahead and make sure that the physicians and specialists who you see will take that plan and also make sure that the prescriptions that you take will be covered under that plan. And if it doesn't, then make sure that you can live with someone new um, and make sure that that someone new is taking new patients. And I'll give you the password now. Our password today is Medigap, capital M-E-D-I-G-A-P. And here I am going to type in the link for you again, the survey monkey. If you can see the chat room, you see it. The password today is Medigap. Medigap is the password. So unlike Medicare Advantage plans, 
original Medicare beneficiaries can see any physician who accepts Medicare patients and the cost of coverage will not change. And they require less prior authorization for services. Emily, I have a difficult time finding home health providers for Humana and Health Springs HMO. No agency wants to accept them, saying they have a difficult time getting paid with limited visits put in place. I have one DME company who will no longer accept Health Springs because they cannot get reimbursed. Herein lies the problem. This is the disadvantage. Out-of-pocket costs can quickly build up if you get sick. So Medicare Advantage plan may offer you a low premium or even a zero premium, but the out-of-pocket savings or the MOOP may not be worth it if you get sick. In fact, we see that Mary Ashcock, who was a senior attorney for the Center for Medicare Advocacy, says the best candidate for Medicare Advantage is someone who's healthy. She completes her thought saying, we see trouble when someone gets sick. And critics of Medicare Advantage plans say that having a global risk pool with all of these funds that they receive daily uh, has so much financial incentive that it allows them to skimp on services, refusing, for example, to pay for a screening or a prolonged nursing home stay uh, that's not mandated by Medicare in order to save money. And then the biggest disadvantage, and this is no small thing, y'all, is closed provider networks limiting the choice of which doctor or medical facility, as in Gail's example, you can use. So the MAP costs largely based on how much medical care is needed, making it more difficult to budget because they're allotting a certain amount of you that comes out of that bucket and they're making profit on what you don't use. And part of what you don't use is what they don't allow you to have. They deny coverage. And so the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, or CMS, has started to notice this. And they're saying that they're going to take some precautions to prevent these MAP plans or Medicare Advantage program plans from denying coverage and covering and paying for medically necessary care. This is according to the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General, and this was April 27th of this year. This was a statement, they came out saying this. Now, any of y'all that deal with Medicare, the OIG strikes fear in the heart of you, I'm sure. If you work in Medicare, you know that the OIG does not play they come after your money and you've got to prove that you're innocent because they assume that you're guilty. This is how they work. So when the OIG comes after Advantage plans, it will be quite the tussle, I expect. So they reviewed a random sample of prior authorization and payment denials by 15 of the larger uh, Medicare Advantage organizations in 2019. So they started collecting data in 2019. Again, when they collect data, things change. Um, so 15 organizations, 2019, they found 13% of the denials met Medicare rules. In other words, if that person were on original Medicare, they would have received that service. And 18% of the payment denials, these are to the providers, the doctors, the nurses, you, met Medicare coverage and their own billing rules. And so denied requests that meet Medicare coverage rules may prevent or delay beneficiaries from receiving medically necessary care and can burden 
providers, the OIG said at that time. And so here's a couple of cases, and you all have already provided some, but let's just look at two that they saw. In one case, they saw a Medicare, oh, FYI, Violet, thank you so much. Ms. Phillips says, HealthSpring is no longer. It is Cigna Medicare. I did not know that. Thank you for pointing that out to all of us. Uh, in case one, uh, the Medicare plan wouldn't pay for an MRI to determine if an lesion was malignant. The plan said the lesion was too small and the patient would have to wait a year. The OIG reviewed this and said that it was medically necessary and the patient should not have to wait. Now, to its credit, the Medicare Advantage plan did reverse its ruling, but therein is the rub. In order to be covered, You've got to A, know that you can appeal, and B, be effective in appealing your case, all the while your coverage is maybe ending or being denied. So the other case, a plan denied a referral to an inpatient rehab to someone with a fractured femur who was recovering. The plan said the patient's needs could be met with home health, essentially, but the OIG decided that this required stay in a rehab, including the need to have access to a doctor to supervise their recovery with the potential to prevent pneumonia from setting in. And so these were two of the cases that they looked at in the OIG report, and you all probably know others from your own experience. And so in your minds, I have another question. And this is a little bit of a side question, but I'll ask if you've got an insurance claim, whether it's long-term care insurance or health insurance, whatever it may be, which department is generally better to call about receiving that claim? So you may file the claim, but if you're not getting any traction, who do you call? What, which department is the best to call? when you have a claim that is being held up, maybe being denied or uh, you know, no, just no, no information. Jennifer Briggs says a patient advocate. Jennifer, do you work as a patient advocate? Um, if you do, you're welcome to advertise here because uh, we'd love to know about your service. Grievance, Ms. Phillips says, well, she knows the, uh, uh, the department, but I would say, call sales. This is the way that I finally got my stepfather's long-term care insurance, which had a 90-day elimination period to begin paying after 11 and a half months. Not 90 days, but 300, you know, something days, 340 days. So I called sales. And when you call sales, you are calling people who are generally incentivized to say yes. And when you call operations, you are generally calling people who are incentivized to say no. These are the limits. Always call the yes people. It's the same if you're trying to set a meeting somewhere. Don't call in to someone who can say no. Call to someone who can say yes. A lot of people can say no. Very few people can say yes. Always go for the people who can say yes. This is a personal aside. You all had much better uh, answers in the chat room, whether it was patient advocate or the grievance department or call Medicare itself. As Ms. Alexander said, all great answers. Uh, but uh, I, I have had luck calling sales. And so the OIG, this is their symbol in front of you, says, will continue to make the case that these commercial health plan abuses must be addressed to protect patients' health and ensure that medical professionals and not the insurance industry are making the key clinical decisions in patient care. So this is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in which 
the OIG is housed. The OIG is essentially its enforcement arm. And I think things will change, but you know, there'll be 70 million of us who are 65 and older uh, by 2029. And I bet 55% of those folks will have Medicare Advantage plans by then. Um, and we'll see uh, what happens. But in the general sense, with all due respect to you, Ms. Phillips, and, and others uh, who, uh, who represent insurance entities, Medicare Advantage plans, and I do bless the, the work that you do. I know that you and your capacity, Ms. Phillips, and others work to help your clients. I know because you call me to do so. So I know that you as an individual are adhering to the social worker or nursing code of ethics that you adhere to and that you are doing your best for your clients. I would say that your employers uh, need to make decisions that are medical in nature. And, and not financial. And that's sort of the crux of it. Uh, our survey is at SurveyMonkey. I will read that to you. It's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash R, lowercase r, forward slash all uppercase letters B is in boy, R, C is in cat, F as in Frank, C as in cat, nine, Y. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase B R C F C nine Y. The password is capitalized, it is Medigap, as in a Medicare supplement plan, like plan C and F, which is no longer offered as of 2020. The evaluation, please have it done by eight tonight. It just means that I can get these, these back to you and then I'm not doing you know one or two or three or 10 tomorrow. Please get the evaluation done. I don't wanna cut it off because I know people will come later and see the presentation and want to, uh, to, to do the survey. And by the way, any of you that have missed any of our uh, CEUs that wanna look at, most of them are recorded. They're on YouTube. If you just uh, search Sean Barnes Care Patrol on YouTube, they'll pull up. And I have a channel, but I really don't know how to get to it. Uh, hence my issue. So thank you again. If you tried to come in Monday and I had technical difficulty, or if you tried to come Friday, when I also had technical difficulty. I thank you for sticking with me. I hope you will stick with me. I hope we're doing a good job for you. And I hope you'll call us with clients, family, and friends who need help with senior care options or aging care options. You know, we'll upload your nursing hours for you, your social workers, everyone will get a certificate. If you have a client for us, call the 800 number on your screen, which is 855-980-2250 or email one of us. It's just our first initial last name at carepatrol.com. I'm S. Barnes at carepatrol.com. I will be providing the slides, Jennifer. Thank you for your kind comment. Thank you, Ms. Phillips, for uh, your attention and uh, your grace. Uh, and all of you, thank you for listening. Do join us Friday. We're going to discuss help with medication costs. A lot of resources in that presentation. I'm hoping will be beneficial to all of you. Uh, and just keep joining and telling your friends about Care Concierge with Care Patrol, which is our uh, educational series. Education is the heart of everything that we do. Uh, I'll be on a podcast coming up in November. You can listen on our national website, or, or you can uh, uh, always join us Mondays and Fridays, most Mondays and Fridays of every month. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you. I appreciate what you do. And I appreciate you making the time to see us in the middle of your lunch hour. Have a great one.